This is Up Close. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. What's wrong with men today? In this episode, we do our best to find out and work on fixing the problem. It's possible that what men are doing wrong is as simple as numbers and economics. Fortune Magazine contributor John Berger reveals those possibilities in Datonomics, How Dating Became a Lopsided Numbers Game. And then, the lazy and terrible ways that men have developed in recent years don't leave them completely beyond hope. Fast Company's Joe Berkowitz and last week tonight's Josh Gonzalman share their thoughts from You Blew It, an awkward look at the many ways in which you've already ruined your life. But first, here's my interview with John Berger about that most common of questions. So we see this problem all the time, or we see it talked about all the time. It's everywhere. It's at, it's when we get together as a family. It's it's uh, you know on Thanksgiving and Passover and holidays, and and it's there when we go to synagogue, and it's there when we when we go to work, and and everybody's asking after this big problem, right? Where I know so many young women, who would who are such great young women, but where are all the men? to pair them up with. Right. Where are they? We all think this is just our own circle of friends or our workplace um, or the people we went to college with. But in fact, it's a fairly universal problem. Uh, for the past 10 years, we've had four women graduating from college for every three men. Uh, so for people, for women looking for a college educated man, there actually is a shortage of men. How does that play out? I mean, it's kind of, it's one of those things which I think people would really be shocked to hear where they would say, well, it just seems like all the good men are, are married or gay, but it, it might actually be true that the vast majority of good men are in fact married or gay in many metropolitan areas. Yeah, so uh, part of the, the <coughs> argument of my book is that it doesn't, that the, this shortage of men, um, this fact that we have 35% more marriage age college grad women than men. Uh, this doesn't just make it statistically harder for women to find a match, it changes behavior too. It basically encourages men to delay marriage and play the field, and part of my argument is that the whole college and post-college hookup culture is a byproduct of this shortage. We've seen the, the singles market change and the dating mechanisms change, and how, is, how do you see that being fed by demographics? I think it's all about demographics. I know that there are some out there who want to blame Facebook or Tinder or some other dating app for uh, the dating culture being more permissive, but I, I really don't think it has anything to do with technology. A lot of the guys I interviewed who were probably let's say the worst behaved, um, they were doing it the old fashioned way. They were going up to pretty women in bars and buying them drinks. You see that across like different technologies, different different avenues, that even when these technologies are employed in different demographic makeups, in, in areas with different demographics, you get different results. You get different kinds of online dating and you get different kinds of of, of dating behavior. I mean I, I do think that online dating kind of locks in certain preferences that we may have. So you know, 20 years ago, if people met at a synagogue or at the beach or at a restaurant and one of them went to college and the other one didn't, if they hit it off, um, the fact that there was some difference in their backgrounds might not matter so much. But nowadays, online dating is a bit like buying a new car and you, you check off all the options you want in the new car or you check off the characteristics you want in your date. And you know the, the children of suburbia in particular don't think twice about checking off college graduate on their online dating site. So they never even see the dating profiles of people who don't have backgrounds like theirs. Right, but there's also this serial aspect to dating, right? Where it's just like because it's so shallow and so frequent and, and just iterates so often, if the if one of the main ways you meet people is by viewing a hundred words of online profile. Then, then you've got the, these judgments become part of the built-in yeah, I, contract. I, I know that's the argument, and you can find a million people who'll, who'll agree with you on that. Um, I, I honestly don't believe that online dating has fundamentally changed the dating culture. And you can really see it in Silicon Valley. I mean, most of these dating apps are invented out in Silicon Valley, and yet about 80% of college grad women in their 30s in Silicon Valley either are married or have been married. In New York, it's 45%. And my argument is this is all about gender ratios. Silicon Valley, there are more men than women, so the dating culture is different. And how much of this is Sarah Jessica Parker's fault? 
I know that, that there is this idea out there. And actually, when I began research on the book, that was my thought. My, my, my assumption going in was that there's something unique about these really cosmopolitan cities like New York or LA or London or Toronto. There's something about these cities that draw disproportionate numbers of fabulous educated women and that, and that the imbalance is, is specific to these cities. In fact, it's not unique to these cities. If you lived in Montana, the, the demographic gap between the number of college grad women and college grad men is bigger than it is in Manhattan. When you look at these differences, how does it, how does it actually play out in people finding mates, in, in, how they, in, in, in how they feel about themselves on the singles market? When you, you drill down to a really granular, granular level, you, int you interviewed a ton of people. And what did they have to say? See, I, I don't think people are, most of the people I interviewed, I, I think they were vaguely aware, the same way at the Thanksgiving Day table, we're all vaguely aware that it's harder for women than for men. Um, but I don't think they had a sense of the statistics. So people don't, don't um, arrive in Manhattan or go to a 60% female school like NYU and start doing a head count and saying, well, there's one, two, three of, of them and only two of me, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play dating differently. Um, I, I just think the culture changes uh, and men become choosier and less in a rush to settle down um, and the women uh, the, the women who do well tend to be those who are more aggressive because they have to be and, and so what is it is it like something in the water or is, it, is there like a pheromone that goes out that says there's 60 percent women here I, most of the um, human social science on gender ratios and how they affect behavior, it actually grows out of animal science. So long before people started researching sex ratios among humans, zoologists and animal behavior experts were studying how varied sex ratios affect animal behavior. And what they find, and, you know, there was one study that was partic particularly interesting that looked at a nominally monogamous species of fish. And what they found is when they took um, the sex ratio in a controlled population from five to five, males to females, to six to four, uh, females to males, um, the, um, the male desertion rate of their mates went from 20% to 52%. So the, whole, the prevailing mating culture went from monogamous to polygynous just by messing around with the sex ratios a little bit. Which means that there's kind of a magnifying effect there, right, that you're talking about where, where there might be Four to three women. There might be three to two, you know, um, women to men. But uh, but when these things actually then play out, the gender, the the, the dynamics get that much more dramatic. Yeah, it gets it gets worse over time. So if you think about it, um, if you think about the math, like the game musical chairs, I'm sure your entire audience played musical chairs at one point in their life, and they probably remember that in the first round of musical chairs, you really have to be not paying attention to, to lose and not get a chair. By the last round, however, there's a 50% chance of losing the game. Um, so the longer you stay in the game, the, the greater the chances of losing. And if you think about a, a, a dating market that's starting out with, say, say you have a pool of um, 40 women and 30 men which is 1.3 women for every one man. Once 20 of those 40 women get married to 20 of those 30 men, the remaining dating pool for singles becomes 20 women and 10 men, two to one. a two to one ratio. So basically, this phenomenon that we're so familiar with, the, the everything going for her 35-year-old woman who's beautiful and accomplished and a great person to hang out with, the reason dating is so much harder for her is because holding out uh, or putting off getting serious about dating actually um, negatively impacted her dating market. And one of the, the interesting things that you put together in this book was how this reveals something about our culture that that this dynamic it and it and for example it reveals that when you lift a lot of caps off of women's uh, potential accomplishments and you tell them they can go to college they can go to graduate school they can earn incomes and so on and so forth and you can and you you can break down barriers you will get wildly disproportionate women to men achieving in that society uh, in terms of 
college, income, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, the, one of the, the questions I try to answer in the book is, it, why is this? Why are women attending college in so much greater numbers than men? And the answer that um, I came up with, and it's, and it's mostly based on, on research by child development experts and neuroscientists, is that um, schoolgirls actually have a biological developmental advantage when it comes to schoolwork. Uh, and high school girls are actually better at college preparation than boys, and that's because girls' brains are about a year more mature intellectually and socially than boys' brains. And anybody, you know, I have teenagers, hopefully they're not listening to this now because I have boys, but, but everybody who has teenagers knows that a a 16 or 17 year old girl is basically a young adult, whereas a 16 year old boy is not. Okay, <laughs> um, and so we see these maturity differences, but we don't think about how this affects um, school pre school work and college preparation. So, one of my thoughts on how to solve the boy problem in school, so to speak, and how to get more boys going to college is that uh, boys should probably be starting first grade a year later than girls. Now that would be a little bit hard to accomplish legally because it would violate Title IX, but most school districts do give parents the option of delaying when their kids start school. I mean, I see this, we know a lot about this raising children in Manhattan, there's the red shirting phenomenon, yeah. right? And, yeah. and particularly parents of boys, they just hold their kids back, hold their kids out of school for a year and send them to kindergarten when they're actually at six years old, not five years old. Yeah, no, it's yeah. smart because, you know, there's been studies done on how those red-shirted boys perform in school versus red-shirted girls, and the boys show much more test score improvement if they've been held back a year than, than the girls do, which kind of goes to show that the boys benefit more from being held back. Right, and, and there's something here about potentially, uh, you know, f at least in the near term, a real change in our society where if women are going to be pr primarily the, the, the college educated population, primarily the well earning population, and also substantially single, so more time on their hands to do things. I mean, there's a real leadership shift there. And, and this whole matchmaking thing could just be, it, it's, it's, in, it's in a sense just us not yet having mating and marriage values that match up with kind of the economic values that are being revealed. Well, on, on your first point, the economic one, I, I do think that, that corporate America really has to do a big rethink on how they're uh, marketing high-end products and high-end services. Uh, you know, you, you never used to see luxury cars marketed to women, but you know, I saw an Acura ad recently uh, which was clearly marketed to women. And I, you know, in, going forward, if we're going to be in a world in which there are going to be a third more uh, college grads who are women than men, um, you know, that's going that's to change the economy and change the way certain goods and services are sold. I, I will say, though, that I, I don't think this is permanent. I, I don't think it's inevitable that that a third or, or whatever the number is, a third of college grad women will never find their match. I mean, I, I, I believe that if you have too many women in the college grad dating pool and too many men in the non-college grad or working class dating pool, I believe those two groups will eventually find each other. And I predict an increase in what I call mixed collar marriages. That would be educated women married to working class guys. And you speak to some of them. Yeah, and and they have marriages that are a lot like a lot of other people, just with some differentiation in roles. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean the uh, it, having a college degree does not make you a better husband or a better wife. Um, and, and I realize that that, it, that it's going to be a little bit of an adjustment because if. Um, if you're used to checking off that college grad box on your on online dating site, um, you know, y y you may not have even, even imagined, uh, a woman may not have conceived of, of a plumber, or an electrician, or a mechanic being in her dating pool. But I, I think we all need to be more open-minded about whom we date and eventually marry. And there's something also about, in these shifting gender roles, men need to learn to be valuable in ways in which they haven't been for a long time. They have to be better, f better longer hours fathers. Oh. They have to be better longer hours homemakers. 
And because if, if you're making, you know, two thirds or half of what your wife is making, then which one of you should be the one doing the dishes? Gee, this is one of the reasons why I think these, these mixed collar uh, couplings do make sense because a, a hard charging career woman who's working 70, 80 hours a week, she could probably use a, a nine to five husband who has time to help with homework or go to Little League games or go to dance recitals because she can't in the same way that the, that the dad of the 50s, uh, you know, you know, maybe was on the road and couldn't couldn't make it to the to the to the little league games back then. And in addition to the mixed collar marriages, there are some other ways in which the demographics can be turned, at least on an individual level, in a woman's uh, in a woman's favor. So we have, for example, you could move. You could move to Wyoming. <laughs> right? Well, look, s some of the my geographic advice, it obviously works better for younger people than, than older women. I mean, obviously a 45-year-old woman who has a whole set of friends, a career, a life in New York City or in Washington or Miami, she's probably not going to pick up her whole life and move to Denver or San Jose, California just because the gender ratios are more favorable there. However, if you have a young woman who's just starting out career-wise or maybe about to graduate from college um, and assuming she's a heterosexual and be marriage-minded, I, I do think this this is something that should be on her checklist. Uh, she should know that that the uh, her marriage prospects are going to be better in Silicon Valley than they are in Manhattan. And what about men on on that end of things? Because we don't have a culture that, by and large, pushes men to marry early and or pushes men to seek uh, to seek you know a partner who can provide for their children. Uh, or, or to be almost to be marriage-minded at all, and we end up with these phenomena where we have forty-something and fifty-something bachelors, uh, you know, marrying thirty-something women because yeah. they f they finally figured it out right. in their late forties yeah. and in, in early fifties. And uh, is there something there about how we should be raising our boys now? Uh, I I, I think there is, but uh, on some level, I, I I wonder that those men who um, who who hold out till their 40s, the dating market is just so abundant for them that it's it's hard for them to make a choice. I think it's kind of the you know this paradox of choice problem where where pe when people have so many choices, choices are not made. Right, and I often say, I mean, I I now know probably dozens of young women uh, who who are who are friends in in the neighborhoods I, I visit, and uh, and. They seem like lovely people. They've been longtime friends, sometimes for 20 years, and and I and I tell them, you know, I don't really have a, a great answer for you on the dating market because they're just, you know, you you're a great woman, and you know, you deserve a great guy. I literally know like three guys, right? You know, and and honestly, you know, I don't I don't know if any, right. any one of them is even suitable. No, when, when when my wife and I were younger, we used to try to play matchmaker with some of our single friends. But as you're saying, when we, you know, as we entered our 30s, we knew all these fabulous women, but we didn't really know any men anymore. Uh, or at least maybe we knew one or two, but they were kind of not exactly on the same level as these women in, in every way. And I, you know, I, I it would have felt odd to set these women up with these one or two guys. So yeah, I mean, as you as you hit your 30s and 40s. Um, particularly, you know, in the Jewish community in New York City, that the 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 demographic gap, the, the the statistical gap between the number of single women and the number of single men, it's kind of impossible to miss. It strikes me that another aspect there is the age gap, where tr traditionally uh, men who'd been you know earning more and this and that and the other thing were and were marrying younger women. Uh, what that was definitely the trend. Are we? Should we see? Should we advocate for a reversal of that to to women marrying younger men? Um, Is perhaps. that where the pool of available bachelors I mean, might I, be? I mean, I I do think. Again, I'm not I'm not assuming that every woman is marriage minded. I'm not even endorsing marriage. But but if if marriage is a high priority for a woman, I'm not sure about dating younger. But I do think it makes sense to get serious about dating when they are younger. Because um, you know, 
I think a lot of people, both men and women, put off getting serious about dating because they're focused on graduate school or their career or other things in life, and they assume, well, you know, I'll, I'll get married when I'm in my 30s and I'll, I'll find someone then. But for women, um, the way the math works, it's just going to get harder over time. So if you're very marriage-minded, um, the, the dating and marriage market will be better for an educated woman in her mid-20s than it will be in her mid-30s. Right. And so is there anything else other than basically shifting your, your sense of exactly what you're looking for in a husband in terms of college education and income and then, uh, and then where you might find them? Is there anything else that, uh, that shifts it in, in women's favor a bit? It depends how far you want to push it. I mean, the, there are certain careers that, uh, that have, I, mean, I think about 10, 15% of people meet their spouses at work. So if you wanted to push it that far, um, there are certain careers like architecture. Architecture is disproportionately male. Now, I understand most people are not going to like, most women are not going to give up their careers to become architects just because, um, just because the, the gender ratios are better. But, but if you were leading that way anyway. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, let's see um, how these datonomics play out over the next, uh, over the next number of years and uh, see if we can help some people end up happy and married. Uh, John Berger, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And now, Josh Gondelman and Joe Berkowitz on You Blew It. So what makes men of our generation so horrible? Like, what was it that, that happened that allowed them to be, that allowed us and them to be so, such decrepit human beings? Where do we even start with that? I don't know, I think um, thousands of years of conditioning, probably. And then Facebook. Uh, Facebook <laughs> accelerated the process. It was thousands of years of conditioning, and then, uh, and then we had Instagram where we could just be like, hey, you're gorgeous, come visit my hometown. And then that just kind of pushed us into the stratosphere of like, oh, we're ruining everything all the time. There's a whole level which I, I, I've been married for more than nine years, mm -hmm. but in the, in the period, thank you. But in the period since I've been married, the dating technology has just grown and grown and grown to the point, I mean, Tinder, it just strikes, this is astonishing, this, this, that this is how people are, are meeting, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's like a, a, a wish someone made from an evil genie. Mm -hmm. It's like, I wish I could have all the, the dating convenience in my palm. I'm like, well, here it is, but it's a nightmare. So uh, that's life now. It's worse than science fiction we've imagined. It's really cut down to the bare essentials. Like, are you nearby? Yeah. You know, rather than like, what are you like? What are you interested right. in? Are we compatible? What like, is where your face? Are you? are you close? It's like almost like uh, how cave men and women dated, but yeah. with screens and uh, Wi-Fi, and batteries were constantly terrified will uh, expire. Yeah. There's just, it's just, you break it down to the, to the most, to the smallest judgment possible, leading to the most mating consequences possible, mm -hmm. and, and no hu real human connections are going on. No, uh, <laughs> I think you can get there, but it's also like, it's such a different skill to have a human face-to-face uh, -face connection versus an online connection. And I think that like one of the big problems with online dating is like, man, we're really good at texting, but we hate talking to each other. But then again, I guess, you know, showing that you're good at texting is a good precursor for a modern relationship since there's a lot of that going on mm -hmm. anyway. Agreed. So. Right, well, you think about it, it's, I mean, so a lot of the things that you see people setting as markers when they're dating, and I'll hear, people complain about how someone ordered from a restaurant and it's like, believe me, if you're several years into marriage and with kids and everything and you're actually at a restaurant, like th <laughs> that, th these are good problems that, right. that you actually be, you're conceiving yourself sitting at a restaurant right. as opposed to just like sitting there and just like endlessly cleaning up various bodily fluids from your children sure. and, and what have you. Yeah, and so like what we set up as, as our ideas of what will work for mates is actually very often quite disconnected from what we actually need in, in those relationships. Right, totally. Like, well, I want somebody who likes the same kind of music that I do. And you're like, well, why? We have <laughs> headphones. <laughs> that is not a problem in 2015 going into 2016. That's not a criteria that we really need to, uh, to meet. Yeah, I feel like you learn about what's important in terms of compatibility just from being with a person you know, rather than you know, finding out like their their likes and dislikes. Mm -hmm. You're you're operating from the premise that everybody already is screwed up. Mm. Yes, but these are involve a lot of individual choices, right? We've talked about how the, on the societal level how we're all 
screwed up, but, but how, does each, how does each person making those choices to get there at every point? Um, well, I guess it's a, it, it's a case by case basis. I mean, you know, uh, there are ways that everybody uh, tends to, to screw up sometimes, and then there are some that's just unique to you, I guess. I think that there's definitely the idea of, uh, most of the ways people screw up I think can be broken down into not thinking enough or thinking too much about something. Mm. Oh, yeah. And so that's like on an individual basis, right? Just to react in, uh, in a moment to something. You're like, we're in society, you can't just do that. Th this isn't like a fight or flight situation. Like that's, uh, that's not how you behave when you're in line at the DMV and someone cuts. You can't just be like, this is not how the world works. You have to like let them, uh, you know, you have to approach it from the point of view of like, oh, well there's seven billion people and I have to behave by these rules. And then on the other hand, you can think too much about something, right? And uh -huh. make a decision where you're just stewing and stewing and stewing uh, and then end up baking it too long. And you're like, ah, uh, here's all the thoughts I've ever had. Take them, ingest them. Wait, are, are we all actually more screwed up than previous generations or is it just better documented? Definitely better documented. Mm, yeah. I think that's it. There's no, pa there's no paper trail for, um, the, how like the greatest generation was screwed up, right? It was like, well, they fought World War II, and the, uh, so now there's not uh, nearly as many Nazis. We reduced the Nazi population by a lot. Right. Uh, and you can drink on that for the rest of your life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But there's no, like, oh man, like imagine the uh, um, OK Cupid profiles of like, Returning World War II soldiers; those would not have been a right. treat. That have been like, I want to PTSD six thirteen. Yeah, know, or like and, just and like, like uh, well, I just came back from war, so I'm a hero, and I need a woman who will make me dinner every night. And it's like, oh boy, that's not that's not a good thing to. You can't say that out loud or in typed words. Because we don't have heroes anymore, or wh what do you think the reason is? Because oh. because theoretically, that's actually kind of how it worked. Yes. Right. Seventy years ago. Yeah. But now, like, women have jobs and stuff, and I think there's a lot. It's like, that's a big difference. So it's like, all the worst things about us are documented, uh, and sometimes we chronicle them ourselves because we don't realize we're monsters. And, uh, and back in the day, we had people that were heroes, but we didn't know that they were also monsters, just like we are now. Yeah, I think historically, history has been written by the victors, but now, you know, history is written by everybody in real time. So it's a very interesting time to be alive because uh, we're just, finding out every single thing that's going on as it's happening. Right. I also don't mean to imply that war heroes are monsters. <laughs> I just mean that they probably also get frustrated in traffic like the rest of us. Right. And so you have some uh, some aspects here of not just documenting what's horrible about uh, you know an entire generation or two of men, mm -hmm. but um, but there's some idea that we can fix some of this. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, how can we fix this? Well, we kept it fairly limited like in terms of advice in the book because you know we're constantly making mistakes still mm -hmm. and I think even having more awareness of the ways you can screw up it might almost make you more liable to screw up but um, I, I think just uh, having uh, more forethought a lot of times and more uh, presence of mind and also I think uh, having allowing a little voice in your head to say what if I'm wrong mm -hmm. you know uh, I think we a lot like society somehow like kind of steers you away from that, but it's great. It's a really good thing that everyone should do. Just check yourself every now and then. Like, wait a minute, is there a possibility I'm wrong right now? Yeah, am I being terrible? Yeah. Uh, and I think being more forgiving of one another is really nice to be uh, to like uh, allow that we might be making mistakes and allow that other people might be making mistakes and be like understanding of that instead of holding everyone to the highest standards all the time because you kind of see the 360 degree picture of everyone nowadays and it like nobody looks good in 360 degrees mm -hmm. you, at best you can hope for 270 and like ah, can you not look at like my knee to my foot I have really gross shins <laughs> and so like you can't uh, you can't expect everyone to be perfect all the time and you can't expect yourself to be perfect all the time so giving yourself a little freedom to uh, to make a mistake and to like not spiral after that. So this is like a very high holidays message here about like acknowledging we all make mistakes, acknowledging the mistakes others make, being forgiving of others and trying to get past what's driving you to do things without you really thinking about it. Agreed. I, yeah. think, I think it's a very, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of good there. And I've always imagined people reading this book while getting ready to fast. Yeah, it's kind of a Cole Nidre accompanist <laughs> uh, accompaniment, a little supplementary right. material. Right. 
all the ways in which you've already ruined your life, <laughs> like Coney Drew. Um, but, uh, and, and when you started the idea for this book, I mean, you're, you're looking out there in the world and you're seeing, you're observing things that are making you feel like this is a moment that, that speaks this way. Mm -hmm. What were you seeing out there among your friends, your, your, fr your family, each other, yourselves? It certainly made going uh, to parties more interesting because, you know, so, uh, I'd have to, if there was a party I didn't feel like going to, I could psych myself up with, oh, at least I'm gonna get some material out of this. I'm gonna see uh, somebody who doesn't wanna talk to somebody else talking to that very person and see them have to try to disentangle from that situation. And you know, in addition to seeing that, it's going to be me in one of those situations. Uh, I'm gonna see somebody forget somebody else's name and stumble and then maybe make a joke about the fact they forgot their name and see the other person still feel slighted. It's th this stuff is everywhere. Yeah, it's constant. It's all those, that little, the fabric of gaffes that holds us <laughs> together. Uh, and, and that's kind of what we what we started from. We were working with our editor on kind of a way to do a, a general um, kind of etiquette guide. And the first thing that came into our minds was like, oh, well, the guide to modern etiquette is everybody's screwing up constantly and it's just damage control. We're doing 24-7 damage control. And so that's kind of the, the premise we started from. And so what are some of the worst examples that, like when you were thinking of this, you were thinking either for yourselves or for those you know mm -hmm. that really pushed this project along? Worst example? I have to say, like the very worst stuff, I kept out of the book because <laughs> I don't either, if it's, so the very worst. The book, watch this interview. <laughs> no, I'm just saying if it's it. very if it's the worst stuff altogether for humanity, then people already kind of know about it. And if it's the worst stuff for me, because there's some personal stories in there from both of us, then I don't want that out there. We talked a lot. The one the one that I do most frequently and that we talked a lot about is replying all to an email that mm. you just mean to reply to, yeah. and that is like the most perilous treacherous situation of modern living, I think, is when you're like, man, I get to email this person and talk some trash about that person, or like even just to go, hey, is this a reasonable thing? I don't think this is a reasonable request, even if you're not being like snide or snarky. And then because we're kind of constantly in motion, but constantly also expected to be accessible to one another, you're like, oh man, uh, Joe did this thing, uh, I really am frustrated by it and I would like it to not happen. And Joe's like, hey dude, you could just tell me. And I'm like, that was just supposed to be for Beth. <laughs> yeah, we tried to put an emphasis on digital stuff whenever we could. Yeah. And yeah, I can think of actually two examples where I've, big examples where I've screwed up that I don't even know if they went in the book, which is one, I replied to an email, or I sent an email about someone to that person on accident. And I've heard since then, as I've come, as I've like aired my grievances a lot, that that's apparently a thing that happens sometimes. You'll have that person's name on your brain, yeah. or you'll mistype, and it will somehow go to the exact wrong person. But I did it once, and it was in a professional capacity, and it was it was very humbling, and not in the way that when people accept an award, they say that's humbling. It was the other way. Where, right, the yeah. real the real way. Really means yeah. not self-aggrandizing. Yeah, I'm sorry, Oscar winner Julia Roberts. I don't know if she said that. We don't want to drag her name through the mud, but yeah. You know, I would never want to judge it now. No, <laughs> um, the, she's sacrosanct. I also am constantly sending not even bad things, but like the opposite of that. I will send like a really uh, sweet text to the text message that I think is with my girlfriend, but it will be to just like the last friend I texted, yeah. and so it'll just be like, "Hey, love you. See you tonight for snuggling," yeah. and uh, I'll just send that. It's like. Uh, sorry, Barry, that was not for you, man. Uh, that was a mistake. And I mean, I guess we could snuggle. I'm not. Yeah. Uh, but then we, your girlfriend might have some things to say. About yeah, it. that's yeah. a whole other conversation. Plus, it's like, man, we didn't have plans to snuggle. I got to rearrange something now. Sorry, Barry. Uh, we, I guess we just can't talk anymore. <laughs> we just don't. There's, it's the scheduling is too complicated. Yeah. Yeah, I, I frequently send messages to people who I assume are my wife, just because I'm speaking to my wife so yep. frequently. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then, yeah. You know, the mortgage payment. Yeah, totally. The diapers. Any yeah. right, diapers. That's like a kind of thing that it's not it's not a horrible thing, right, to send to the wrong person, but it's certainly in the moment you get that flush of being mortified of like, hey, can you pick diapers on your way over? Pick up diapers on your way over, and it's like, man, I was gonna bring nachos. And you're like, yeah. oh whoops. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, dude. <laughs> yeah, I whenever I've done that, I've almost I feel a little guilty because I've almost like given an, an invasive look into my life and like thrust it at someone else 
like like here, take a look at, at what I do when I'm you know talking to my, my right. girlfriend or whatever. This is what I'm like when I think I'm not being observed by anyone other than the most intimate person in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's uh, you don't want people to see that. Like you don't want people to hear the song you sing while you brush your teeth. And we're constantly giving each other glimpses of that by accident. What song do you sing when you brush your teeth? Oh man. The latest one I've been I've been singing to myself a lot is um, "Want to Want Me" by Jason Derulo, which is uh, it's uh, it's a great one to sing, but it's <laughs> it's an awful one for someone to catch you singing or whistling. I'm like a whistler too, which is the worst habit, and people catch me all the time because I don't realize I'm doing it. Yeah. My greatest fear is I'm gonna like butt dial on accident and then have it go to voicemail while I'm singing to my cat absently while working. Oh yeah, I sing to my dog all the time and it's all song parodies. Um, <laughs> same, same, yeah. Lately, What's your been, cat's name? Uh, well, oh wow, uh, this is exactly the wrong place to get into this, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> all right, this is actually a perfect story. Uh, okay, so uh, my uh, then girlfriend, now fiance, uh, had a cat with a, oh man, with a little black spot beneath its nose. Okay, and her, where this is going. And her roommate nicknamed it Kittler. Now, we were always a little uncomfortable with that because it started to stick and we were like, we don't know what to do mm -hmm. because the other name we gave it was, I think it was Buster at first, just was not sticking and, and Kittler was more popular. And so we shortened it to Kit or Kit Kat and that's what its name is now and that has stuck. But uh, yeah, in order to get there, I had to tell the other part of the story. So yeah. Um, you didn't, Joe, we're on television. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, yeah, the whole point of changing it was so that no one, none of my uh, very Jewish family ever found out about it. So, and then Joe, I- Joe, we're on the Jewish that. channel. <laughs> yeah, I, know. Yeah. I know, I just, uh, yeah. And we sent free subscriptions to his whole family. Yep, that's yeah. true. Oh, uh, man. I, that was very kind of you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, do you, but did this, I guess the point, the only reason I brought that up was because uh, did the song parodies include the cat's name? Yeah, that was, I was, what I was getting toward <laughs> was that um, lately what I've been doing because of the, the holiday season is it's beginning to look a lot like uh, Christmas, but like I'll just, like, I, uh, like just the little cat named Kit Kat. Anyway, oh, I'm, so cute. yeah, I, yeah, so now not only, have I, not only have I revealed the source of uh, Kit's old name, but uh, it's also, a parody that's a Christmas song, and I just said that my greatest fear was that people would hear me singing to my cat, and they just did, so great. This is the best thing I've ever been a part of. <laughs> this is a great moment for all of us. I think so. And, but I, it, it strikes me again and again that like these are the things that we're joking about, and these are the things that, but we're, we're actually seeing like, the decay creep up on us in a very real way. And then a lot of the words that you're using and, and, and the problems you're describing, they speak to themes and ideas that, you know, that are kind of eternal ideas and eternal themes that are really being upended by an age in which we're being, you know, I, I hear people use the word efficient a lot mm -hmm. around communication. Yeah. And it's, that's not actually what communication is supposed to be, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and you hear, and people are worried about being vulnerable with each other mm -hmm. in these moments that you're talking mm -hmm. about, but you're actually supposed to be vulnerable with each other. Yeah, and you're not like, supposed to have this, Avatar online that's just your, your right. permanent essence that, that somehow keeps your dignity alive. Yes, I totally agree. Like at, at no point in history did you, like we look back on people from history and we don't see the, the wrinkles and cracks, right? The way that we see them with living people. But at no point was there a way to like project that your life was great other than like having people over for dinner and lying to their faces. And that's like the <laughs> grand tradition, right? There was no way to just like trick everyone in the world into thinking your life was something it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Even necessarily consciously, but I guess for some people it's more conscious than others. And I think, I mean, particular like if you're out on the dating market mm -hmm. and, you're tr and you're putting together, I mean, I know people, you know, people are getting professional headshots done mm -hmm. who aren't people who normally would get one in the course of their work. But they get it done for the purpose of having a Facebook profile mm -hmm. picture. And then mm -hmm. that becomes how they actually interact with their actual friends, mm -hmm. not just the people they're gonna randomly meet on the internet and yeah. so forth. Yeah. I mean, no one ever says keeping up with the Joneses anymore, but that whole idea of like wanting to fit in, wanting to do what everyone's doing, that I think it's like accelerated uh, well, exponentially lately. Well, now it's not that there's a Joneses in every neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? That you have to keep up with. Uh, in in a, uh, av they're not the avatar, right? We're all just keeping up with the Kardashians. That's what everyone does now. Yep. It's not the it's not the individual 
Joneses, it's the one family that we're all like, well, that's the, uh, that's, that's who's setting the pace. Wait, which Kardashian are you? Which Kardashian? I'm uh, Chloe. Because? Because I'm loyal <laughs> and because I care. So that brings us to, I guess, where I wanted to go finally with this book is that this is a very gendered book. Mm-hmm. And, and there's an idea here that men are doing it worse or are more liable for what's going wrong, are, are more culpable in what's going wrong. Uh, why is that? I think the book projects that because we're both deeply sympathetic to the plight of, uh, of being a woman right now. Uh, it's just that there's more ways than ever to communicate like your interest in a woman, even if she's just trying to live her life. And it's just, it's got to be difficult to deal with. And uh, I think men sometimes or frequently just kind of uh, take advantage of that access and just, you know, can easily ruin someone's day on accident constantly. And since it's a book about uh, ruining days and or ruining moments that might on a bigger scale ruin days, definitely figure we'd uh, have to like, get a lot of stuff in there about how uh, men might not even be realizing they're doing that more so than just people in general. And we're both men. So mm-hmm. we're writing from the point of view of like, really what we're saying is like, here are the bad things about us. <laughs> Here's what we do wrong. And it feels, it would feel slightly disingenuous. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of overlap between what men and what women do wrong. But it would seem a little uh, gross of us to just be like, and here's why women are bad. Because really what we're saying is, here's why we're bad. And maybe men or women relate to that. And I think if, if in a big picture, there, there's a lot of how men are screwing up uh, the world. It's uh, men are in charge of a lot of stuff, and they've they've screwed a lot of it up. And uh, you know, maybe uh, hopefully moving forward, we can have a, a greater equality in the world where women can screw up just as much as men. But it also, it feels true even on the granular level, right? Just on the level where you know neither of you are heads of state, mm-hmm. but but you're experiencing this as and seeing that just around all around you and in yourselves, the men are screwing up more. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it's true. <laughs> yeah. Mia culpa. Yeah. Yeah. And then within that, um, you know, so it it strikes me that we have, uh, by and large, in America, this lar- like a larger discussion going on around privilege and what have you in in, in different realms, and um, and in within, for example, within the income realm, you see a lot of people talking about, oh, well, but it must be so hard to be in that top 15th percentile, and looking at that top 5 percentile and seeing how much they make, what a generous view would be to look at the 85 percent of people below you and say, wow, they must, how much more could I be doing to help these people? And and we're doing that, like, socially, too, that that we're seeing people who are acquiring, right, and acquiring and acquiring and acquiring as opposed to looking at whom they already have or, or those who have less, I guess, and, and, and being more generous. And specifically here in the gendered sense, of what men are not really say, you know, men who have far more opportunity to find a great woman in today's urban environment in America are not looking at women and say, well, let me be generous for a moment and be socially generous. Yeah, I think that's a real value, that to, uh, generosity and like empathy and uh, I, I think it's something we, we could all do a little better at. And I think men are not always taught the value of that. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's more like, well, you, go, you break your leg and you still finish that football game because you have to crush the other person. Um, you can tell physically that that's what, that was my upbringing. And, and I think it's a great value to um, teaching people to like, empathize with the condition of others. Well, I hope your leg feels better. Josh Goblin and Joe Berkowitz, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. That's all for this week's episode of Up Close. A reminder, you can also listen to an audio-only version of this program as a free podcast available on iTunes and your favorite podcast player. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, Iowa Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast on the on-demand menu on TV. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.